My name is Adrian Nanchev, and this channel is all about helping you become a remarkable entrepreneur. But today, I'm joined with Maurice Lafayette to talk about his business. So, Maurice, please, what is it you do? Tell us about your company. What is your What's your story, and what difference are you making in the world? Oh well. Uh, my company is Quantum Monkeys. We are a business consulting company. Uh, we started as a, a as an agile coach group, but we grew from there. You know, we we noticed that many many companies are ill-equipped to deal with the uncertainty in the changing market and the speed that all of this is going everywhere. So it creates fears. It creates paralysis. You know, and uh, and traditional way of thinking business mean taking at the least amount of risk possible. So we tend to overthink and and get paralyzed in all that analysis and thinking. So uh, we help those companies to, you know, to be more reactive, to experiment more, to try new things and to do it in a safe and, and you know, in a safe way and quickly enough to be able to, you know, to to produce value out of it. Let's go back to the question already. Oh, all right. Okay. <laughs> so, Interesting. Uh, that, so, that's, yeah. All right. So when you say agile coach, is that anything to do with incubations at all? Business incubations? No, not me. Uh, we, you, we, we can help company who are still in incubation. Uh, but most of our clients are actually uh, either startup already out there in the world or well-established company. We have some uh, multinational working with us. Mm-hmm. The larger they are, the more difficult it is for them to adapt. Wow. And they, while they do have money to be able to, to weather change for a long time, um, the world has been changing steadily for the past 15 years uh, and a little bit more. And, uh, and many of them just start to realize that it's costing more and more and more just to be able to resist that change. Yeah, I've, I think that when it comes to business, that the, the, okay, firstly, the bigger the business is, exponentially more complicated, more exposure to risk, everything can be. You know, the, the more people you introduce, it gets m- exponentially more complicated. When one thing goes wrong here, it has a massive knock-on effect everywhere else. Yes, that's why we, you know, we try to help them break down the you know, other company in very, very small element. You know, 10 people, it's not hard to manage. And whatever they are going to do, if it doesn't implicate too many other people, it's not going to be very risky. So when you rethink the way you organize even very large company in a lot of very small modules, then you reduce that risk and you reduce all of those problems as long as you don't try to manage everything in the old ways. So we try to, to foster distributed leadership as much as possible and the building of platform uh, that, you know, that will define the, the rule of the game for everyone. And depending on where you are in the company, you plug into different platforms. So you know what to do and you have a lot more leeway that way. I don't manage anyone. I don't have a team as of yet. So I'm at the very beginning, early stages of entrepreneurship, arguably. But um, I, I heard, I was told... And I observed that an over-the-shoulder kind of approach to management is ideal. Not too much micromanagement and not too much macromanagement, just over-the-shoulder. You know, being being like fair but firm, but at the same time pushing them, always challenging them because it's a way of like helping your team grow and always you know, ch- challenging them, expanding their comfort zone. If you are a business leader, then I have a question for you. Yeah. Why don't you pay your attention to the business instead of the people in it? Yeah, okay, as a business leader, now teams and and worker in general, they need uh, uh, to be supported. So you can have you know, the the traditional manager. The role start changing. They manage a lot less. They support a lot more. So you want to grow your people as much uh, uh, as possible, so they are able to to make right you know, a good decision. And as a manager, your job now is, okay, what can I do to help you achieve that safely? You know, as to not 
put the company in trouble. So as the business leader, you don't have to manage them. You have to show them where to go. And if you hire the right people, if you give them the right environment, they will take you there. But then the question that I always am concerned about is how do you hire well? How do you hire the right kind of people? I'm, 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 I feel it's a case of hiring the people based on the passion, what they love, as well as integrity. Because if they love to talk about what you're going to sell and advocate in the world, then that's great. And if they have the integrity, then that means they're not going to you know, cheat or swindle you and or your customers. The, those are two great criteria. You need to keep one thing in mind. Those kind of people, the more intelligent they are, the more passionate they are, the less control you will have over them. So you need to make sure to create the right environment for them so they can do their thing without having to ask you every 30 seconds and, uh, and still moving in the direction you want them to move. Controlling those people means that you're going to train them, then lose them. Yes, that's why... That's why I feel integrity is quite important because they they feel they feel a loyalty to your company to your business. Well, loyalty goes both ways, but when businesses always have the excuse that this is a business decision, I'm sorry, then people uh, uh, have latched into that over the years. So. The, the the good employee that you might want understand that they too can make business decision. It's not a matter of blind loyalty. They will stick with you as long as they have what they need. And it's not always about money. It's, a, 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 it's about being awesome. They want to be awesome at what they do. They want to be recognized for it. They want to be support in doing that. So they can bring you to new aid, but you, 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 they, they will be difficult to control. That's the main point. And asking for loyalty is uh, it, it will be a red flag for a lot of them. They will give it to you if you deserve it. If you de- if you deserve it, interesting. Yeah. So I'm I'm very curious. Then how do you go about deserving the loyalty? Well, understand that the employee are not there for you. They are there for themselves. They need room to grow. They need to be comfortable, I'm not in, uh, uh, both in, uh, in money and, uh, and life. You know? They need to be able to, to, to give you their best. It might sound strange to say because most managers always want your 120% or 200%, but asking for it and creating the right environment for an employee to give it, it's two very different things. They want to you know, to keep uh, maintaining their own autonomy. So, yes, they will do what you need. They will go in the direction you want, but they need uh, uh, to be able to do it their, you know, their own way. If you hire people, you hire them because they are expert at what they do. If they aren't, don't waste your time or understand that you are hiring someone who, you know, who's more junior, pairing with someone who, who, who isn't, and make sure that both of them grow in skills very quickly. Ah, interesting. Uh, are you familiar with uh, uh, Daniel Pink? Daniel Pink? Yeah, uh, this one here. No, I, I can't see you, and uh, no, I'm not oh. familiar <laughs> with Daniel Pink. Okay, uh, so he wrote the book Drive, which explained what is intrinsic motivation and why extrinsic motivation, the classical uh, carrot and stick, doesn't work anymore. Okay, so it's all about uh, purpose, uh, mastery, and autonomy. Help your employee to achieve that, then you're good. Interesting. Can, can you tell me more about um, his works and how it how it has affected your methodology? Well, uh, he was uh, one of the first to, to, you know, to really address that whole new way of thinking about motivation. It has been uh, picked up uh, by uh, Jürgen Apello with uh, Management uh, 3.0, which is also a, a, a great, uh, a great uh, um, sorry, um, it's not just a book, it's a whole method of approach management that's really based on uh, on making people better than they are and um, and letting them grow and help 
and having them help you grow your you know, your business. So it's all about intrinsic you know, motivation. You don't have to say people you need to be happy to do this. They will be. Okay. If if you cater for your know, further need for mastery, so they need to get better. They need to be challenged, and they need to you know to have their success being recognized. Uh, they will grow much faster like you know, like that by themselves. Um, autonomy is the need that you know they have to be able to manage their own work. You know, we we are talking about self organization more and more everywhere. Well, I'm come from the agile field, so uh, uh, it's uh, it's it's everywhere in, in our uh, in our philosophy. It means that people should be able to make their own decision. It doesn't mean that they can do whatever they want. It means that as leaders, we give them the direction to go. We give them any constraint that we need. And for the rest, we trust them to do the right thing. Okay? And yeah. Um, I remember what Agile is now. It's it, to, do, to do with manufacturing as well. Lean manufacturing, Scrum, yeah. Scrum management. I have a book on that. Yeah, but, and we go into this event recently. That's normally once a month. Uh, not Scrum from... is, a, is a specific Agile framework. Yeah. Uh, I don't teach them anymore. Uh, I don't teach Scrum at all. It's an old social technology. Uh, yeah, we, uh, we have it... moved more toward Kanban, and uh, mm. even if you don't follow any kind of framework, it's fine. Just that when you said agile, uh, what came to mind was uh, just business incubation. But now I remember now. Um, Taichi Ono, are you familiar with him? Yeah. Seven Waste, the Seven Waste, Tim Wood. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, those are, uh, well, yeah, uh, yeah they, you know, they are very big in the lean movement, which is now integrated with agile. Yeah, what can you tell me about the Seven Waste? You know, there's Tran, um, oh, what was it now? Tran, uh, I'm losing you. What, what can you tell me about how the seven wastes and, and how it affects Agile and how it affects companies or Taiji Ono and his philosophy? Well, I can talk to you about waste in general. Otherwise, I would have to review that material. <laughs> but waste in general is one of the largest problem in any company. You know, you, you have waste of time, you have waste of material, you have waste of money. The the largest waste we see everywhere are, are, you know, are waste of time and waste of effort. Okay. As soon as you start multitasking, you are dividing your attention over several things at once, meaning that instead of delivering one thing well, you will kind of maybe deliver several things eventually not as well. So that's a huge, huge waste. Uh, uh, there are also the notion uh, with your attention of slack time. You know, we see manager uh, um, organizing people time up to a hundred percent. You know, they are proud. All of my people, uh, I have accounted for hundred percent of their time, which is completely ridiculous. You now, every time that you do that, you're going to patch them a lot of little tasks and a lot of meetings and. Every time that they will lose their focus to go into something else, it is uh, a waste of time. The more you 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 plan for them a hundred percent, the more you're you're going to tire them. We need some slack time. Now about fifteen to twenty percent every day. It doesn't mean that it's not going to be productive. It means that it's not planned. Uh, meetings are another time waster. No, uh, I have clients, a lot of them, who do meetings to plan other meetings. Okay, Meetings where you have 40 people there. Most of them uh, are multitasking hmm? and uh, not really paying attention to the meeting in, in, in question. Now, if you, and meetings last forever. I saw half-day meetings often. And... Those kind of meeting usually end up by well, this is a meeting. It's not the place to you know, to decide anything. This is horrible. A meeting should be a small thing just to uh, to align uh, our constraint, align our vision, make a decision, and we leave there with action points. Now, a meeting should never be larger than the minimum 
uh, number of person that you absolutely need to make that meeting. Anyone else is superfluous, you can get rid of them. You know, meeting lasting more than an hour are usually way too long. Uh, for, you know, for material, uh, traditionally, you know, uh, in the manufacturing industry, they used to buy in bulk as much raw material as possible. They, they make spare part uh, ad, ad nauseam just to be sure that they never miss any. But the introduction of lean uh, has brought first in those uh, kind of industry, but now it's everywhere, the idea of just in time. You know, you don't do work that you're not going to use right away. Everything must bring immediately consumable value all the time. Otherwise, condition will change, uh, market will change, reason will change, and you will have work for nothing. So those are the largest type of waste that we see everywhere. Oh yeah, we also have waste of talent. You are your amazing people, okay? brilliant minds, specialist, and then you put uh, uh, someone from middle management to tell them what to do, how to organize their time, and how to prioritize their work. Basically, you take someone who doesn't know how to do the job to tell them how to do theirs. So it will create discontent, and it, 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 because they, they are not going to work efficiently, they are not going to be able to prioritize on what needs to be done first. You know, those are kind of uh, of relationship that we work hard to you know, to change. A company can have priorities. That's that's the way to go. But the specialist should be the one uh, saying how we are going to organize in order to deliver them based on the constraint that you gave us. We need to do this by this date, for example. So it's a whole change of dynamics to to get rid of all of that waste my only quarrel with just in time and i always heard this in the um like toyota in like a manufacturing context is that even if you do buy in bulk you know the next two months worth of of inventory the aggregate cost per per component or, or certainly the nominal cost per component goes down because you're buying it in bulk and, and you might yeah. not need that part for another two months yeah so I'll give you an example. In a, in a very stable uh, market, you know, buying in bulk in advance is because you can predict. Now, imagine that you're buying in bulk enough to reduce your cost so that, so that specific model of car, for example, instead of cutting, you know, costing you, I don't know, 20000 it's ballpark number. Let's say that it costs you 15000 a piece. Okay. You have enough for the year at 15,000 a piece, so you're well ahead. Except that two months during the year, you realize that you haven't sold one. And uh, the, 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 all of the critics are bashing on that car. No one's ever going to buy it. So what advantage do you have to be able to build, I don't know, half a million of them at 15,000 when you're not going to are you going to build them and not sell them? Or you know, what are you going to do with your parts? The idea is there. As soon as your market and your environment become hard to predict or will change quickly, and let's face it, except for very specific industries, now this is the norm. Things move quickly. You know, a year is a long period of time. So when you have that kind of change, you need to be a, a, a fortune teller to be able to predict well enough to make those kind of investments. So the idea is, yes, per unit, no matter what the work is, doing just in time is going to cost you more, but you're going to save in all of those stock that you're not going to be able to do anything with it. Yeah, I never thought of it that way, stable and predict market. Uh, yeah, it makes yeah. sense in that, in that regard. But... Um... I'm also curious. You mentioned multi uh, multitasking earlier. Yeah, I, I remember a mind experiment, a thought experiment, a few years ago, where it had the alphabet A, B, C, and then the numbers underneath them, one, two, three. And what you had to do was, you had to say the number and then the corresponding letter in sequence: A one, B two, 
yeah, eight mm-hmm. weeks, so on and so forth. And that took almost two or three times longer as opposed to just going through the numbers and the alphabet themselves. A, B, C, one, two, three. But doing it individually was much quicker than doing them at the same time. So that was that was a, 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 a mental experiment that I, I experienced a few years ago to demonstrate the, uh, the, the, delu- the delusion of multitasking, where it's just much quicker and easier to focus on a single track, on a single thing, complete it, and then do the next thing. Yes, yes, we do the same uh, same uh, example here. It, it's a it's a standard. Uh, we use the number one to ten, then ten to one, then one to ten in, in Roman numerals, and we have different group doing that, and we crum uh, a chromator everyone. It's great to convince people of uh, uh, of how difficult it is to multitask. Yeah, I mean and. And uh, going, also going back a little bit, the uh, Teichi Ono, he talked about the seven wastes. I remember, yeah. well, uh, seven, I believe, Tim Wood. So it was transport, inventory, motion, waiting, overproduction, overprocess, and defects. Is that kind of like the template that's you know still applying today? Or do you know something a bit more smarter, a bit more updated? You mentioned a few others, like the uh, waste of talent. Uh, mostly uh, in, in lean environment, they are still the same. Even mm. in pretty much other environment, but you know, the waste of motion and, and, and those motion doesn't apply everywhere. So uh, we, in more and more, we, you know, we work with a more general idea of waste. Of course, if you follow Kanban, for example, you, you are going to see the exact same seven type of waste and they will add a few more. You know, uh, so, uh, so, so we usually talk about the ways that are um, you know, that are pertinent in the specific context uh, of the company we are you know we are helping. What are some of the common pitfalls that businesses experience? Um, the most common are the company who wants the result but are not ready for the change. Okay, we see that. Most often, with company who you know, has heard about agile, especially uh, based on uh, Sutherland's book, uh, "Twice the Work and Half the Time," so they know the title and that's what they want. But they are not ready to do anything to move toward that. They just want the result. So they will create Scrum teams everywhere. Which again, Scrum is not the ideal uh, framework for most of the place I work. Um, and uh, but they they do not support them. They still have to follow uh, the same type of uh, financing that uh, the rest of the company has. They still have to follow the same uh, um, uh, people management rule. They still have the same hierarchy. So it's not working because. Uh, when, when you go agile, no matter the framework, even if there's no framework, or uh, when you go Kanban, you work at a different speed with with different types of constraint. So to be successful, the company need to understand what is needed for those group and give it to them. You know, uh, we, you know uh, everywhere where you know, where we can do successful transition. It usually means um, all of those groups that are going to change are kind of put aside. We, you know, we, we try to remove as much as possible all the dependencies. Dependencies kill pretty much work you know, and work pretty much everywhere. So we try to reduce and eliminate you know, the dependencies first. Then they work with their own role. They are financed a certain way. Usually, you know, you know, they have a very stable uh, financing system based on team rather than uh, you know, uh, than uh, uh, project or or, or uh, based on value streams rather than project. So, uh, so that's that's a earlier uh, a a a less, and then. Um, we we make sure that their objective are tied to what they are doing. Uh, most of the time, uh, you know, when uh, when you do um, HR, you have all of those huge objectives that are done once a year. They don't change, and 
when you work with uh, with an approach like Kanban or Agile that move much, much faster, it means that you put the employee at odds between what's best for them, m- meaning following the other objective, because some sometimes, most of the time, there is a, a financial incentive to do so, uh, or doing what is best for the company. It sounds strange, but we put in the end of our employees, are you going to work for you or are you going to help us? Uh, This is a dilemma that shouldn't even exist. Now, we are all in the same boat and you want your employee to do the best for the company. So it needs a little more um, supple rules. It needs that planning cannot be done a, a year in advance. You know, planning is always short term. You can have a vision for where you want to go, but pretty much everything else is going to change over time. So it's evolving planning. It's evolving organization. We try something, we see that something else would work better, then we try something else. But in in, in many, many companies, they are not ready to even accept this, this kind of, uh, of, uh, of dynamism, is that a word? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it moved too fast for them. You know, uh, before trying something, before trying an experiment, they will often ask a whole study for it. Why? How much that study is going to cost? Then if you take that, that amount of money, cut it by half, and make sure that your experiment cannot cost more than half the money for the study to to check if the experiment is good, then you can do it. An experiment should take a day or two to do. No more than that. A week, maybe, at the most. Yeah, I see. It, although, I'm, although, I'm just curious. Um, going back a little bit, you mentioned a book. Something on the lines of twice the work, half the time. Who yes. is the author? It's uh, Jeff Sutherland. It's one of uh, Scrum Creator. Damn, I don't want to do any uh, any marketing for him. Honestly, the, the that book has caused me so much trouble <laughs> over the year. Me ah. and a lot of other uh, agile consultants too. Uh, all right, that's all right. Okay. Now, uh, <laughs> bef- now before the before we wrap this up, though, what is what is next to Quantum Monkey? What, what's happening there? What, what's the plans for the next six or so months? What, or certain, well, planning is short term, but what's the, what's the vision? Well, uh, Quantum Monkeys have always been a company uh, created to do experiments. Okay, so instead of just going to one of our clients and bring a new idea, we test it internally. Um, last year, for example, it was our big experiment with deliberately developmental organizations which uh, are a type of organization when you, you, where you have full transparency and you challenge everyone all the time. Okay, so people grow so incredibly fast. Uh, it took us by surprise. So this year, uh, well, in the next six months, we are trying to find, again, some small experiment to see how can we, because when you develop people very, very, very quickly. They each start up wanting to do their own thing. So how can we find a way to keep all of our people within the company and allow them to grow and develop the company the way they would like it to be developed? So uh, this is our main concern internally right now. So it's going to be great fun. Externally, we are, we are making a big push. We have mostly work in the, in the tech industry so far. But uh, we really want to start working with uh, uh, NGO in pretty much every kind of, uh, uh, of setting. You know, agility has, has, uh, has gone a long way see, you know, since it started as, uh, uh, as an approach for software development. And, uh, and we want to bring that elsewhere. So we want to democratize agility more and more. You know, we, we follow the modern agile philosophy that you can find online, modernagile.org. It's very simple and can apply everywhere. So that's where we want to go. That's where we want to, to, to help more and more people go. You mentioned experimenting. Yeah. Yes. 
I think, certainly in business, that is the re- the best way to go forward. Always experimenting, trying new things, doing new new ideas, just tweaking the strategy or the plan ever so slightly. Just see what happens. Even experimenting in life. So it's 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 end, it's thirty first of July right now, and I have not shaved until <laughs> since May. <laughs> I've got a bit of a big beard here. I don't know. It's six or seven centimeters. Just experiment to see what will happen. See how I feel. How how people react. It's the longest it's ever been. It's the longest time I've, ne- I've never shaved before. So experimenting. So I'm taking that. I personally, as a side note, I'm taking that same principle of experimentation and applying it in life as well. Yeah. The key is small control experiments. Okay. Small so and you're controlled. Yeah, small and control. The idea with small is to make sure that it stay below your your uh, your um, your threshold. Where you know if it goes above that, it's it's going to start hurting you if if it fail. If you keep it below, then you can succeed or you can fail. If you succeed, all the better. If you don't, then you still learn something and you can try something else. You, know, you won't get into trouble. It won't cost you a lot of money. It you know. Keep it simple and small. Most of, most experiment work best when you have a set of constraint to them. The most important constraint is when are we going to finish that experiment? Either it's a success or we just discontinue it because it's a failure or it's a, or or it's non conclusive. Now there is no point in keeping uh, an experiment going without tangible result for months keep it small always try something else maybe at some point you will go back to that experiment with a new insight and you're going to be able to do something interesting with it yeah you never know what you're going to learn as well exactly now um maurice what is the best way for the audience to get in touch with you and or your company through our website uh, quantummonkeys.com just send us an email that's the easiest way okay we also have a blog on medium under uh, quantum monkeys so we 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 talk about a lot of subject it's bilingual both english and french but most of the stock there is in english that's all right okay yeah well well morris it was very nice having you on the show thank you thanks for coming on it's my pleasure and also remember that if you haven't already subscribed, click on the subscribe button below and press the bell notification right next to it for the latest uploads. And uh, you'll see me again soon. How cool is that?